Okay, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce the final speaker of the conference, and that's Dr. Stephanie Beal, recent graduate from the University of Waterloo and now with uh, Keysight Technologies. Okay, hello everyone. Um, as Nick said, um, my name is Stephanie, um, and today I'm going to be talking about randomized compiling in the fault tolerance setting, um, and specifically as it relates to measurements. Um, so earlier this week, we had a talk by Pavi, who spoke about randomized compiling at the physical level and how that impacts error correction. Um, I'm instead going to come at this from the perspective of what we want to do with gadgets at the logical level and with measurements. Um, so what this talk is about is basically we have some assumptions about noise in quantum error correcting codes that are helpful, but they're not fully accurate. Um, and the first assumption that I'm going to talk about is that we often assume a stochastic polynoise. Um, and Robin really paved the way for me on this one, so thank you very much for that. Um, so our recovery methods are often poly. Um, it's easier to model than coherent noise, as Robin spoke about at length. Um, and uh, we also know that in error correction, um, the syndrome measurement actually decoheres the noise. So one of the things that I'm going to talk about um, later in this talk is that if our syndrome extraction is imperfect, um, it won't perfectly decohere the noise, and so we have some coherence left over, even beyond what would be left over under the condition that we did have perfect syndrome extraction. Another assumption that we often make is that our syndrome extraction is either perfect or follows a model in which the um, outcome bits are probabilistically flipped. Um, and we do this because it's easier to model than a fully general measurement map um, and it applies across systems. It's just a much nicer model to work with than uh, a generalized map. So the structure of the talk is kind of given uh, up here. Um, so first I'm going to start with some preliminaries. Um, this will be review for most of you, but it will introduce the figures and format that I'm going to be using to, just, to talk about things throughout the talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about states, operations, and errors in quantum computing. And then I'm going to talk about um, measurement, or measurement randomized compiling, uh, which is how we get the form of measurement noise out of, at the physical level that we typically assume. Then I'm going to go through the same steps in quantum error correction. So I'm going to do the same preliminaries in the quantum error correction setting and talk about how to get probabilistic uh, noise on the syndrome extraction circuit. And then at the end, I'll talk about how to compile other types of gadgets using logical randomized compiling. So to start with some preliminaries, uh, throughout the talk, I'm going to be representing a state space as an orange sphere um, and a state in the state space as a black dot, so shown here on the left. Um, we have two classes of operations that I'm going to be talking about. The first are stochastic poly operations. Um, which can map a beginning state to a discrete set of possible states within the state space. And then we also have coherent operations which can map to any state in the state space. Um, so a stochastic poly error, as Robin talked about, is a probabilistic application of a poly operation. Um, so with some probability you'll have no error. Usually that's higher than the probability of error. Um, and then with some other probabilities you'll map to a discrete set of po possible states using a poly operation. Uh, coherent errors, like coherent operations, can map to an arbitrary state in the state space. Um, so the shaded orange is denoting where the thing can map to. Um, and it's often implemented by having an over-rotation of an operation or having some background evolution uh, in the system. Uh, so one thing that we're going to be concerned about throughout this talk is coherences. And what I'm referring to when I speak about coherences are these sort of cross terms that look like this. So if we have a coherent operation, it can be written as a sum of, of operations. So if this is a coherent rotation that would apply an X operation, um, you'd have some I term and some X term. Um, so coherent operations obviously are powerful because you can rotate to any state in the state space. And if you start from a pure state, they create superpositions. Um, so for example, applying this to a pure zero, uh, you would get this pure zero out and a pure one out, and you would also get these coherences, which come from having an identity on the on one side and an X term on the other. Um, so yeah, throughout the talk, coherences refers to these cross terms. 
Um, and here I have cross terms between zero and one, so individual states. Later in the talk, I'll be talking about cross terms between, or coherences rather, between subspaces of the state space that will want to be removed. Um, so measurements, when we apply a measurement, what we do is we remove coherences between these state spaces, um, or between the um, eigenstates of the measured operator. So in a computational basis measurement, we're measuring the Z operator, which means we're projecting onto either the one or the zero state, which removes coherences between zero and one. So it would remove those cross terms from the previous slide. So as I said, two possible outcomes, you're either projecting down onto the zero state or projecting down to the one state, and that will be represented by these arrows. Uh, the measurement noise model that we typically assume is that we um, measure using an ideal projector. So we're projecting down onto a zero state or a one state, but we're probabilistically misreporting what outcome actually happened. Um, so we represent this by a confusion matrix, which is a matrix of probabilities that tell you the probability of reporting a given outcome given that another outcome occurred, um, which looks like this. Um, but we actually have seen that this isn't consistent with what's happening in devices. So there was this recent paper um, that came out earlier this year that did um, tomography of non-demolition measurements in, um, in a quantum device, and it showed that it did a full characterization of a Choi matrix and showed that the, while the dominant error was bit flips, um, there were coherent errors that happened when they did a, a measurement on the device. So our measurement model is not actually accurate with what's going on in a system. So just as a reminder, our goal is probabilistic noise. So we want stochastic polynoise on operations, and we want confusion matrices on measurements. Um, and as we've seen a few times, we already have a method of doing this for operations. So we have randomized compiling, which takes a coherent noise on an operation and gives us out an operation with a stochastic polynoise. Um, and as a recap of how this is done, basically what we're doing is for every difficult round of gates, or particularly noisy round of gates, we're taking a random poly and inserting it before the gate, and then a random poly plus a correction for the poly that we applied before, and inserting it after the gate, so that the net circuit is equivalent to the, the circuit without these additional polys. And then we're compiling the added gates down into neighboring circuits. Um, so we're not increasing the depth because we're compiling neighboring polys into uh, the, the neighboring gates. And we're also not generally increasing the number of shots because we're already going to be running the circuit for many shots. So each randomization is on a different shot that we would already be running. And then when we average over this, we'll get uh, a map that has stochastic poly noise rather than coherent noise. Um, so what about state preparations and measurements? So we have randomized compiling for operations. Um, I'm not really going to be talking about state preparations in this section, although I will a little bit for the error correction setting. Um, but now I'm going to present um, our method for um, com or tailoring noise in measurements. So how do we get probabilistic measurement noise? Um, we're going to be using random powers of Z. Um, so recall this. Uh, state that I had earlier, I'm going to use this as an example. Um, so our goal, again, is to remove the coherences between zero and one here. And so if we have one circuit that has uh, identity or applies nothing, and then we have another circuit that applies a Z operation, the effect of that is going to be to introduce a negative phase on these coherence terms. And so taking the average over these two circuits, these terms will cancel out and we'll be left with a zero state and a one state which again is consistent with what we would get if we did a measurement in the computational basis, because that also removes the cross terms. Um, so again, averaging over powers of Z operations applies a projection onto the eigenvectors of Z. So putting this into practice, what we're actually doing is we're taking a, a bare measurement and we're applying a power of Z, so if this is Z to the power of zero or one before, and we're doing the same thing afterwards to project down onto the computational basis before and after measurement. And then we're additionally applying these powers of x, so a power of x here, and then correcting for it after the measurement and in the readout output. And what this does is it symmetrizes the confusion matrix. So the powers of z project us down onto 
the computational basis, which enforces the confusion matrix noise model for the measurement. And then the powers of X symmetrize that confusion matrix to make it simpler to model. Um, so I have down here the average effective channel. And what this is is um, the rounded ket is representing a vectorized um, computational basis state. Uh, so this is the classical outcome. This K plus A would be um, measuring basically the input. And then the K plus B would be the output. So you have a reported outcome K. K plus A would be the state that you had coming into the measurement. And then K plus B would be the state coming out. So there's a, a bit flip relative to what you actually measured potentially, which is consistent with the confusion matrix noise. So if we apply this to subsystem measurements, um, basically to get the full probabilistic noise as we talked about before, we're also going to want to twirl the unmeasured qubits. Um, so this is basically a randomized compiling step. So you're sampling a gate G from some group, usually the poly group, and then applying a correction for that inserted random poly after the, the unitary that you're actually intending to implement. And then the effect of this is this confusion matrix measurement, as I showed before, plus an ideal unitary times some stochastic poly noise model, which is enforced by that randomized compiling. OK, so now we're going to go through pretty much the same process, but in the error correction setting for a syndrome extraction circuit. Um, so as I expect everyone here is familiar with. Um, when we do quantum error correction, what the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a state and we're going to encode it in a subspace of a larger system, which we call a code space. Um, throughout this talk, I'm going to be focusing on stabilizer codes in particular. Um, and then we have um, co-spaces of the code, which are generated by these pi slices um, that correspond to each syndrome. And the union of those I'm going to refer to as the syndrome space. Um, so each syndrome has a co-space, and the union of the co-spaces is the syndrome space. Um, yeah. So as in the physical setting, I'm going to talk about two types of errors. The first is stochastic errors. Um, so polys are applied probabilistically, and they can map within or between co-spaces. So in the stabilizer code setting, we have three kind of types. The first are um, stabilizers, which leave the encoded state invariant. The second are pure errors, which can map to different co-spaces within the code. And then the third are logical errors, which map within a co-space. Similarly, we have coherent errors that can map to arbitrary states in the physical space. And importantly, if we have a coherent rotation about a pure error or a multiple of a pure error, it can create coherences between the co-spaces. And this is something that um, measurement would typically remove, but if it's implemented not ideally, it can leave some behind. So again, two types of coherent errors that we're concerned with. The first are coherences within the co-spaces, which are caused by rotations about logical errors. And the second are coherences between co-spaces, which are created by rotations about pure errors. So as I said, syndrome measurement projects onto a co-space, um, which removes coherences between the co-spaces. Um, so Analogous to before, we had Z projecting onto the eigenspaces of Z. Here we have um, stabilizers that, when we measure them, project onto eigenspaces of the, the stabilizers. Um, and the measurement noise model that we typically assume is, once again, a confusion matrix. So we have these co-spaces, each of which is associated with a syndrome. And uh, under this noise model, you would probabilistically misreport which syndrome occurred. Um, so pretty much all of our methods for dealing with measurement noise in error correction assume this model. Um, so being able to enforce this as a noise would, is quite helpful for that. Um, so as I've alluded to earlier, our confusion matrix noise model in syndrome extraction isn't actually what's going on. So even if the actual measurement does follow a confusion matrix model, which we can enforce using measurement randomized compiling, uh, we showed that if we over-rotate the control generator operation that we do as part of uh, syndrome extraction, it can leave behind some of the coherence um, that might have been introduced in the code. Um, so this is just a syndrome extraction circuit. So we've got a Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform, and controlled A, where A is typically the generator um, of the stabilizer group that you're measuring for that syndrome bit. 
So how do we get probabilistic noise in syndrome measurements? Uh, there are three things that we need to address. There are coherences between the co-spaces, there are measurement errors on the physical measurement that don't follow a confusion matrix, and there are coherences within the co-spaces. So I'm going to step through how to address each of these things in this section. So starting with coherences between the co-spaces. Um, earlier I talked about um, how applying average over Zs projects down onto the eigen basis or eigenstates of Z. Um, similarly, if we average over powers of the stabilizers, we project down onto the eigen bases or onto the co-spaces. So this removes coherences between co-spaces. Um, it's a similar process. Uh, you're just applying a random stabilizer at a given point in each circuit and then averaging over that to get this effect. So if we apply this to syndrome measurement, um, we'll use this dumbbell looking thing as a placeholder for the syndrome extraction circuit and then we have a physical measurement. And what we do is we apply a random stabilizer before the syndrome extraction and one after. And this ensures that the final state is in the syndrome space because we're projecting down onto the syndrome space here. And the random stabilizer applied beforehand um, ensures that uh, coherences between the co-spaces are eliminated before the measurement so they can't interfere and add up during the measurement and cause further problems. Um, so we've addressed the first point. The second point, again, was measurement errors that don't follow a confusion matrix. And as you might have guessed, we have a way of dealing with that, which was measurement randomized compiling, as I talked about earlier. So you're just replacing this physical measurement with a uh, version that's compiled, like I showed in the first section. And this ensures that the measurement follows a confusion matrix-like model. And then the final thing that we need to address for syndrome measurement errors are coherences within the co-spaces. And for this, we're going to look at the actual form of that syndrome extraction circuit, which again is this Fourier transform control generator and inverse Fourier transform. And to compile this, we're going to do a, a sort of logical randomized compiling step. So um, these L's that we're adding in are logical operators or logical poly operators on the code. Um, so this L is applied, this L corrects for it because A is a generator, so acts trivially. And then this G of L, which should also depend on A, is the portion of L that's propagating down through the control A. And we're also applying a random poly and then undoing it on the readout register as well. So what this does is it enforces a um, stochastic logical poly on the encoded space and a stochastic poly on the physical space for this uh, control generator operation. So now we have a fully compiled uh, syndrome extraction circuit. Uh, let's look at how we get probabilistic noise for other operations in error correction. So for a state reset and preparation, um, we're going to apply the same tools that we discussed before. So a bare state reset would take this form. This is just a placeholder symbol for it. Uh, and then we would apply a random stabilizer after to ensure that we are in the syndrome space when we have prepared a state. Um, for unitary operations, we do a similar thing as with randomized compiling. So we would take a bare unitary, apply a random stabilizer before and after. So these are S and S prime. They're not correlated. This is also to project down into the syndrome space before and after. And then we would do something like randomized compiling. So we would sample from a group to get G and then apply the correction um, that undoes that effect. Um, so typically this would be a poly group, like the logical poly group. Um, but it could vary based on what gates you're applying and what gates you have available for your system. Um, finally, for measurement, we can do a logical version of measurement randomized compiling, uh, and we just add on a stabilizer randomization beforehand as well to ensure that you're in the syndrome space when you start. Uh, so this actually generalizes. So logical randomized compiling and measurement randomized compiling hold for the QDIC case by replacing the poly group with the vial group. And measurement randomized compiling can be applied by measurements in different bases by picking um, twirling operations that are consistent with which basis you're compiling in, or you're measuring in. So to summarize, um, measurements are typically assumed to undergo noise that can be represented by a confusion matrix. But this assumption isn't accurate, particularly for non-destructive subsystem measurements, which are very common in error correction. Um, so we showed how to tailor measurements to follow this form by applying a compilation technique to the measurements called randomized compiling. 
our method removes entanglement between the measured qubits and the unmeasured qubits, and combining with randomized compiling allows us to tailor the noise of the unmeasured qubits to a stochastic form as well. And we showed how to compile operations in a quantum error correction setting using logical randomized compiling to ensure that the state before and after any operation is in the syndrome space, which reduces the likelihood that coherences between co-spaces can interfere with each other and build up in harmful ways. Um, so thank you guys very much for listening. Thank you for having me to the organizers. Um, I'd also like to thank my collaborator, Joel, and PhD supervisor, Ray Latham, um, as well as the IQC, University of Waterloo, and Keysight. Do we have questions? One in the back there. Hey, um, I have a clarifying question on the slide where you showed that you applied two random stabilizers to like before and after the controlled measurement. Um, in which sense can I think about the state then being in a, um, in a fixed syndrome space? Because as far as I understood, it's only the averaged, uh, the averaged state kind of, because you need to twirl over your whole group and then you... So you're like asking... Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, you said this is a like this operation of sandwiching the um, stabilizers is a projector. Yeah. So the aver on average, it, it projects down onto the syndrome space. It doesn't for an individual one. Thanks. One in the one in the front here. It's all right. Take your time. Thanks for a very nice talk. I think the idea is really beautiful. Could you comment on what's the trade-off here, like to uh, remove coherence during the computation? For example, do you have to repeat many times? Like, wh What is the cost in doing this? Uh, yeah, so like randomized compiling, you can do this, um, like put the randomizations in at each shot. Um, so you would typically be doing multiple shots anyway, and so that doesn't really add much overhead. Um, and likely, you can probably compile things into neighboring operations. So for Clifford's, you're going to be inserting random polys um, in between rounds. And so um, you can compile them together. And if your gadgets start and end with uh, a round of single qubit polys as well, you can compile that in. Um, if not, that would introduce some overhead in terms of depth. Um, so it depends a little bit on the form of your circuit. And you would want to consider that when deciding whether and which parts of your circuit to use this for. I see. Thank you so much. We've got a bit of time. Anyone else? So I have one question. <clears throat> the question is, so you had on your slide, although you didn't say the words, but you had it on your slide that a qubit of prime dimension Oh, yeah. That it works. It so what, it what fails if it's not a prime dimensional qubit? It actually, Cubed it. It actually does work for not prime dimensions. I forgot to update that. It, it works for non-prime as well? Yeah. Okay, good. And does it work for continuous variable? I don't know. Okay. All right. Well, um, let's thank Stephanie and all the speakers of this session. And let's all 